Archbishop Salvatore Cordelioni is coming up in a moment. But first, some news. In the wake of the Amazon Synod, the Vicars General of the Catholic Church in Germany issued a letter this week calling fundamental reform of the church urgently necessary. The Vicars General represent the ten archdioceses of Germany as they embark on a two-year-long synodal path instituted by Cardinal Reinhard Marx, the president of the German Bishops' Conference. In the letter, they call for a church in which plurality and diversity are desired and permitted. The so-called synodal path of meetings will address key issues, including the sex abuse crisis, priestly celibacy, and the role of women in the church. Seems we just saw this movie. And though Thanksgiving has yet to pass, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas in Manhattan. Cardinal Timothy Dolan presided over the traditional blessing of the nativity animals at Radio City Music Hall. In addition to a rather friendly camel who took a liking to the Cardinal's stylish beret, several well, Radio strange. City Rockettes were also Amen. present. <laughs> Way to go. Congratulations, everybody. And from New York to San Francisco, my next guest is a candidate for president of the U.S. Bishops Conference when they meet next week in Baltimore. I sat down with him earlier to talk about the fall meeting, the Amazon Synod, and a special mass, a traditional Latin mass, that he will be celebrating on November 16th here in Washington, D.C. Here's my interview with Archbishop Salvatore Cordelione. Archbishop Cordelioni, I want to start with the Bishop's Fall General Assembly coming up next week. Now, one of the items on the agenda is an update to the program of priestly formation. What needs reform there, in your opinion? The new vision of priestly formation, well, continuing vision, uh, looks at it as a matter of going through different stages. The uh, new PPF uh, is implementing what they call a propedeutic stage. There's a propedeutic stage, a discipleship stage, a pastoral integration stage. The idea is that the students would complete one stage before moving on to the other. I think a big part of the discussion will be this propedeutic stage. Uh, bishops will be interested in knowing how to fulfill the demands of this. This would be focusing a lot on areas having to do with human formation mm -hmm. uh, before moving on to the next level of seminary formation, ways to accomplish this effectively without, I think, dragging on more time that is required mm. for seminarians to go through their priestly formation. Archbishop, given the abuse scandals that we've seen here in the U.S., what changes do you foresee or would you like to see in the formation of priests vis-a-vis -vis seminaries? I'd mentioned uh, human formation, which will be especially a focus of the propedeutic stage. I think uh, that will be a key element, uh, certainly continuing to vet candidates who are admitted to the seminary. We need to be ever attentive to that and, uh, and clear with that. But helping them to understand, uh, overcome any, any challenges they might have in the area of effective maturity and healthy, um, mm -hmm. living out a healthy sexuality. Uh, so we can focus on that in this propedeutic stage, and then, of course, it needs to continue throughout their mm. seminary formation. But uh, I think uh, this, it's this area of human formation that is critical. Uh, Archbishop, I want to move on for briefly to this Amazon Synod, which just wrapped up in Rome. Um, as you know, the, the Synod Fathers called for the ordination of married men on a regional basis, at least. That's how it appears now. They also ask uh, for an explanation or exploration, rather, into the possibility of female deacons. Your thoughts on this? Is this what we need now? Is this the solution to the priest crisis? We've had two commissions already study the question of women and the diaconate and have concluded there is no historical basis for it. Certainly there was an order of deaconess that had their own specific duties and responsibilities. I think looking at issues such as these are, is too superficial of an approach. Mm -hmm. If we think that for a long time the church had plenty of priests, now mm -hmm. the numbers are down in many parts of the world, especially those parts of the world where Christianity is, goes back to for many centuries or even mm -hmm. to the very beginning. So the problem is at a much deeper level. It's, it's, it's more of a spiritual crisis than just a numerical crisis. So I think we need to look uh, to the deeper issues if we won't really want to uh, resolve 
what problems we're facing with regard to the vocations mm. uh, to the priesthood and religious life. Archbishop, at the November assembly, uh, the bishops will vote on a new president. Currently, Cardinal DiNardo of, of Galveston, Houston, serves as president. A total of 10 archbishops and bishops are on that presidential ballot, including yourself. Now, if you are elected, what would you consider the most pressing item that the conference needs to address in this moment in the life of the church? We are constantly uh, hearing uh, at all levels in all areas of the church I go to the need for evangelization, especially evangelization of, of the young uh, people. Mm -hmm. I think this would have to be kind of the focus issue uh, for, mm. for this, uh, these uh, forthcoming years. Uh, we under Bishop Barron, of course, has done a lot of work in this right. area. He understands the issue very much in depth. I think we have great, uh, great tools to use, uh, great resources, uh, which certainly he provides us, among others. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to utilize those better in, in evangelizing mm. uh, our people, and especially the young people, who I think are open. They're, they're spiritually hungry, and I think they're mm. open to receiving the message if we know how to communicate it to them effectively. Bishop Barron was actually here on the Hill not long ago, uh, last week, and uh, during a talk, he mentioned that Pew study that found 26% of the population now identifies itself as having no religious affiliation at all. How do you reach those people? What would you do to reach them and evangelize them? And an initiative I'm uh, working on now is uh, holding up truth, beauty, and goodness. The church has always understand, understood the power of truth, beauty, and goodness mm -hmm. and uh, has built Western civilization on these pillars. It, whether it's the area of science and with truth, uh, the new catechetical resource we have available, mm -hmm. in the area of goodness, the church is the largest private provider of social services in the world, largest private provider of health care in this country. The church is doing so much in that area of goodness. I think we also need to pay attention to the area of, of beauty and lift that up. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the one of the three that has been least looked at. And the church mm -hmm. has so much, have so much in our patrimony in the area of, of music and mm -hmm. art and architecture and literature. And we, we need to build that up. And we're beginning to work on that, especially especially with the area of sacred music, yeah. uh, new compositions of masses of sacred music, well, and, I, uh, which and, and, we will be um, yeah, related, promoting at a event in Washington, D.C. next month. Right. Well, related to that, I want you to tell me about this pontifical high mass of the Americas. Uh, it's really a, a part of a Marian unity tour, and you helped organize this. It began in Mexico in February. It's coming to the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in D.C. on Saturday, November 16th. Tell me about it, and why did you want to initiate this kind of uh, uh, roving uh, uh, tribute and, and uh, really it's, 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 it's almost a moving prayer service. Yes, the whole inspiration for this began almost two years ago when in the Archdiocese of San Francisco, the Saturday before December 12th, we have an Archdiocesan-wide celebration of Our Lady of Guadalupe, what mm. we call the Cruzada Guadalupana. begins with a procession at 6 o'clock in the morning, a 12-mile procession. It arrives at the uh, cathedral at about 2 o'clock where we celebrate the Mass with thousands of people there. Wow. Well, last year, when I noticed early in the calendar year last year, that would be December 8th. So we would be celebrating the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception, the patroness of the United States, as we were having this big archdiocesan-wide celebration in honor of Our Lady Guadalupe, the patroness of Mexico and all of the Americas. So that's when I got the, the inspiration to uh, take advantage of that moment, hold up Our Lady as the mother of all of God's children. She, like any mother, wants us united as one family in God. Mm. So with this idea of commissioning new masses of sacred music, we have a composer, an accomplished composer of sacred music in our area, here in the Bay Area, Frank LaRock. I asked uh -huh. him to compose this mass of uh, new comp compositions of sacred polyphony, but incorporating the melodies and the sounds of the popular music the Mexican people sing mm. on our Ale de Guadalupe, especially the Himno Guadalupano, mm -hmm. uh, so they can recognize those melodies as has the feeling of those sounds. Hmm. So that's how we came up with this name of the Mass of the Americas. And we see this as having a great power for uniting our church. Hmm. Uh, we all love our mother. She has various titles. She's appeared in various parts of the world. Uh, and she is the one who really brings us together. So we begin to t sort of take this on the road. 
The first oh. time it was celebrated was in our cathedral, St. Mary's Cathedral, on December 8th. It was celebrated in Tijuana uh, in February. Mm -hmm. The Archbishop uh, asked for it to be uh, the concluding mass of a national congress on liturgical music he was hosting. Mm. And we will be doing it, uh, as you had mentioned, in the National Shrine in Washington, D.C. on November 16th. Yeah. This time it will be in an extraordinary form, solemn high pontifical mass. Mm -hmm. This is also a sense of building up unity with the church's right. worship because th there were some adaptations that had to be made with the music, but it will be the same music, the same vestments, a special set of vestments was commissioned mm. for this mass. So the same vestments and the same theme uh, of unity uh, to bring us all together. Again, holding up this a pillar of beauty as a way of evangelizing and, and uniting and healing. Uh, Archbishop, I want to give people a little sample of Frank LaRocca's music. This is the, the music that was composed for this forthcoming Mass and really for all these Masses that, uh, that you've been celebrating. Well, watch. Why do this now? Why undertake an effort like this? What, what do you see in the times that require this, uh, but this sacrality, this uh, outpouring of music and, and, and uh, tribute to Our Lady in her various forms? Very good question. We're facing so many crises in the church, in the world, so much conflict and division and attacks on the church. And so, uh, we're, we're reacting a lot. I think what we need to do is, again, hold up what has helped the church build the civilization we've inherited mm -hmm. that's within our patrimony. Again, the power of beauty to evangelize. It will call attention, call people's attention to all that is true, good, and beautiful. Yeah. I think this is a way of, of, in the current context, when we're so much kind of reacting and trying to defend uh, defend the church and, mm -hmm. and make sure we're doing everything correctly. It's, we can get too bogged down with being on a, in a defensive posture. Mm -hmm. And we need to go out and evangelize. We need to show what the church has to offer to the world. Mm -hmm. This is uh, one, I think, very, one very effective way of doing that. Yeah, five years ago, you founded the Benedict the Sixteenth Institute for Sacred Music and Divine Worship in your diocese. Why? And how important is it to keep these sacred traditions alive in the church today, I especially the gestures uh, associated with the old mass, the extraordinary form? Mm -hmm. It's an attempt to continue the work of liturgical renewal that uh, had begun as people have studied uh, history of the liturgy know mm -hmm. well before the Second Vatican Council was certainly called for at the Second Vatican Council has been furthered by uh, Pope Benedict XVI which is why we named the uh, Institute after him mm -hmm. of, of uh, uh, the sense of continuity with the church's worship that what came as Pope Benedict teaches what was beautiful at one time and, and holy doesn't cease being that it continues now so uh, to help with this sense of continuity in the church's worship to reclaim what it was within our patrimony but in a way that builds up with continuity so this the idea of doing this mass of the americas in both forms with the same music and same vestments and same theme mm -hmm. is to try to show this sense of continuity with the churches we have certainly we have much more diversity in the way the church worships today and we need to do it all very well mm -hmm. because different forms of, of, of styles of music or styles of worship will connect with different people. So we mm -hmm. need to do all of them well. Our but I think we need to continue to uh, hold up what is sacred within our tradition. It happens in the secular realm, right? Mm -hmm. Classical music, it's not like Beethoven and Brahms are passe and can no longer speak to today. They're mm -hmm. still performed and new compositions of classical music are still made. Mm -hmm. So I see this uh, principle also applying to the sacred realm. Mm. Before I let you go, uh, there's, a, there's been a lot of reportage on this priest in South Carolina that uh, denied communion to Joe Biden and explicitly for his 
support of abortion, uh, his public support of abortion on demand. Your thoughts on denying the sacrament to uh, elected individuals, public figures who remain uh, entrenched in uh, teachings and ideas opposed to the church in a public way? I've uh, said and, and thought for many years that uh, this is another, this is a crisis in, in catechesis. Uh, people have to be uh, taught about what the Eucharist really is and the sense of worthiness to receive communion, being in a state of grace. Of course, none of us is worthy of this tremendous gift, but the, mm -hmm. the idea of being in a state of grace, which right. means accepting and believing all of the teachings of the church, living in accordance with those teachings of the church. So anyone who... Uh, contradicts that or fails that in a serious way has to avail themselves of the sacrament of uh, reconciliation and penance. Mm -hmm. This is basic Catholic teaching. I think a lot of people don't understand that anymore. We've seen the, the recent uh, Pew research right. poll that shows the decline in belief of the, the real presence. Mm -hmm. And I think too many people see the Eucharist as just a gesture of, of welcome and being part of the family. That's mm -hmm. a part of it, but it's so much more than that. So we first of all need to help people understand what it means when we're receiving the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. and, and people who uh, advocate for what is seriously evil, such as abortion, is it's hard to imagine anything more gruesome, uh, who publicly advocate for that, um, which is different from voting for policies mm -hmm. or, or, or promoting issues that might have, have the effect of reducing abortions, but mm -hmm. uh, still keep it, for example, legal. There are mm -hmm. lots of policies about informed consent and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, to uh, aggressively advocate for these, it it's also causes a scandal and, and causes people to be, um, to be misled. Mm. So I think we need to do a major uh, education effort on the part of our people to understand these principles. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, and I think even in the press reportage, it, you know, it, it's portrayed as somehow a negative thing and a, a, a penalty uh, against an individual. Instead, in the mind of the church, this is a merciful act to wake up the, the, the individual involved, the public individual, and say, wait a minute, you're outside of communion now. You need to right yourself and come back in. I mean, that's really what the denial of, of the sacrament's about and protecting the, the sacrament itself, which is your vow. Yes, and, and the good of the old, the individual soul. It's never mm -hmm. merciful to do anything that's against the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, the destruction of an innocent human life is, is a very grave matter. So it's also for the good of the individual to understand the seriousness of this evil and the need to repent of that mm -hmm. and to seek reparation for that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the individual's good, protection of the sacrament, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, integrity of the sacrament uh, and the public good in terms of not creating scandal, all those yeah. ha ha has to be respected. Archbishop Cordelione, thank you so much for being here. For more information on the Mass of the Americas on Saturday, November 16th at the Basilica of the National Shrine here in Washington, D.C., visit massoftheamericas.org. Archbishop, thank you for being here.